So, I'm Adam Haggard, Director of the Foreign Policy Centre. We are d- here in Parliament today to discuss the theme, Coming to Terms with Kosovo's Past, Civil Society, Transitional Justice and Historical Accounting. Um, we are being very kindly hosted by uh, my friend Karen Buck, MP, who is the MP for Westminster North, a constituency with a notable Kosovo community amongst us. Um, and um, we are here today particularly to look at the findings of some work that the University of Lancaster have been doing as part of a British Academy project entitled Transitional Justice and Transitional Journalism, Understanding the Role of Journalism as Non-State Actors in the Delivery of Historical Justice, a case study on Kosovo. Uh, That's a a mouthful, but it's a a meaty meaty mouthful of of research that we're going to talk about in hopefully some um, more general and accessible terms uh, today. Um, And we've brought together a mixed panel of uh, experts uh, and uh, politicians. Uh, so we'll be being joined by Baroness Amin Kahelic very shortly. She's currently voting in the House of Lords, uh, well, or has been, uh, and will be joining us at first proceeding. On my left is Professor James Sweeney, who uh, has been heading the project. He's the Professor of International Law at the Lancaster University Law School, and he does interdisciplinary research into the artefacts of conflict, principally human rights issues in transitional democracies and the rights of refugees. Um, um, on my right over here is Dr. Bertie Julia Gippert, who is Senior Lecturer in International Relations at the University of Liverpool. Her research focuses on global government and international post-conflict peace building. Um, and has published on issues around police reform in Kosovo and Bosnia and local legitimacy in peace building. And on my right here is Dr. Florian Kejer? Chehar. Chehar. I'm terrible at uh, names and that's why we'll try and say as few names as humanly possible. Uh, So Florian, for the rest of the evening, uh, is the chair of the board of the Kosovo Centre for Security Studies, uh, a leading security think tank in Kosovo and has been previously the executive director of that organisation and he's currently here as part of a sabbatical with the uh, Royal Defence College. Royal College of Defence Studies. So we are delighted to have uh, such an august panel here with us today and and as I said Amika will be joining us as soon as she's finished Um, but if we can start off with James to sort of give us an overview of what we're going to be talking about today that'd be great. Okay, thanks very much for the introduction, Adam. And thank you all for coming out. Thank you also to my uh, co-panelists. Um, so, as Adam said, my name is James Sweeney. I'm a professor of international law at Lancaster University uh, in the northwest of England. I think I'm contractually obliged to tell you we're uh, in the top ten uh, at all three of the league tables. Um, there, I teach international criminal law, human rights, and transitional justice. What I'm here today to talk to you about is what I hope is an interesting and innovative interdisciplinary project between law, social sciences and uh, media studies, examining the role, for better or for worse, that the media can play in the post-conflict environment. Okay, well, uh, Adam's asked me just to, to, to carry on, so, so I will. Um, so what I'm going to do is say a little bit about the background to the project and introduce some key terms, terms which I think we all agree are highly contested. I'll then give you a sense of what the aims and methods of the project were. Then we'll look to what the findings were and uh, we'll start mapping out what the implications of those findings might be. So the project is about transitional justice and transitional journalism. I'm going to explain both of those terms now. Because of the TJ, TJ, the project became known as TJ Squared. Um, So that's what you can see in some of the materials. Um, And I will have a little handout to distribute at some point so you can look into and remember fondly your evening listening to this talk. So, what do I mean by transitional justice? Well, for me, it is an area of both research and practice. It's about the identification and analysis of justice in respect of the legacy of authoritarianism and armed conflict. To me, in my work, it's not a monolithic or even coherent 
plan of action or roadmap. Different transitional justice processes contain different emphases at different times. So some of these interventions we might recognize as transitional justice might be more retributive. So I'm thinking of um, criminal prosecutions, International Criminal, for, uh, criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia and the Specialist Chambers uh, we were talking about earlier on. Other transitional justice interventions might be aimed more at rehabilitation. I think we'll hear about the, the work of the Trust for the Victims established at the, uh, via the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, which allows some very innovative work to go on uh, with the victims of international crimes. The statute of the uh, Tribunal for former Yugoslavia has, uh, confers no power whatsoever to deal with victims. Uh, so the, the Roman Statute the Criminal International Criminal Court is, is a marked development in that regard. Yet other transitional justice interventions might more be aimed at reconciliation or memorialization, truth telling, historical accounting, and symbolism, tearing down statues, if you will. So from that short example, I, I've given you different types of transitional justice intervention that may be more or less underpinned by considerations of retribution, rehabilitation, reconciliation, and reparation. I'm not saying that all of those happen at the same time. I'm not proposing to rank them either. But it's clear that also, and this is what's interesting, that they're not always compatible with each other. So a retributive approach, where you put the bad guys on trial, would be incompatible with the motives underpinning the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, for example, which was more focused, of course, on establishing the historical record and which allowed people to exchange testimony for uh, amnesty from prosecution, or at least to apply for it. Uh, and many, many people uh, were refused. Only about a third applied gain it, just to be clear on that. So, as I said, the identification and analysis of what justice means in this context. I would say that there have been better and worse manifestations. But if you're going to make that sort of evaluation, of course, you need a perspective, and there are many. I would say these interventions that I'm labeling transitional justice are not necessarily labeled at the time as transitional justice. And of course, there are a bunch of people that would just reject that term uh, outright and prefer something like uh, mass atrocity justice or post-conflict justice. I'm going to use that term you know, during the rest of the presentation, transitional justice, that is, but I accept that it is uh, one that is open to debate. So these measures are not necessarily labelled transitional justice, and they might not even be recognised as such by those engaged in them. It is normally carried out by state institutions or international organisations, but I think there's an increasing realisation that non-state actors can play a role, and I'm going to have a little linguistic game here, not just in affecting transitional justice, but also in effecting it, as in doing it as well, for better or for worse, and self-consciously or not. This project was looking at the role of the media, self-consciously or not, for better or for worse, in affecting and effecting, so changing and actually being part of the delivery of transitional justice uh, in Kosovo. This builds on the observation that there exists, in the same way as empirically observable transitional justice, a form of transitional journalism. Again, it's not a coherent plan of action, and there are good and worse examples of it. 
But unlike in relation to transitional justice, the analytical framework required to develop a perspective by which you can analyse and judge transitional journalism is at best embryonic. Again, just like transitional justice, those engaged in transitional journalism might not label it as such and might not agree even that they are engaged in doing it. But this project, as I say, was to investigate, for better or for worse, the role the media have played. So, what were our aims? Again, to examine the role played by the media in a post-conflict environment to determine whether distinctive behaviours support the existence of transitional journalism. And, if so, whether distinctive behaviours, uh, sorry, and if so, whether key debates in transitional justice might inform choices about the practice of transitional journalism. We took Kosovo as a pilot study because it displays both post-communist and post-conflict elements. Uh, it is also the case that the researchers are relatively familiar with the context and contacts there. Um, so uh, I've worked with Florian for many years. Uh, I've worked out there also with the Council of Europe. What we did was look at, well, we conducted 30 interviews with media professionals in Kosovo. They were semi-structured interviews, and we've subjected those to fairly rigorous analysis through NVivo. What we found were broadly two categories of finding. They're not watertight categories, but we got a load of data about the challenges of reporting on transitional justice, things like pressure from editors or society at large in covering certain topics, particularly in respect <coughs> of the uh, allegations against the Kosovo Liberation Army and the establishment <coughs> recently of the um, Kosovo Specialist Chambers to investigate those allegations. For me, one thing that I found interesting was that there was next to no engagement with or interest in reporting about the transition from communism. Um, the data reveals some suggestions why that might be, but the focus is very much on the, the post milosevic era. Where it gets interesting is the data that suggests that the media, again, self-consciously or not, for better or for worse, are playing some sort of special role that delivers what, if it were carried out by the state, could be recognised as transitional justice. Not all of it is good. I saw examples of transitional journalism underpinned by retribution. Uh, one way of describing that is vigilante journalism, the worst example, and it's a fairly notorious and fairly isolated one, but not 100% not unique, uh, involved the image and address of an alleged collaborator with the Milosevic regime being published, and that person then uh, being disappeared and found dead uh, some time afterwards. I would describe that as vigilante journalism, not necessarily a good thing. More recently, um, there is a very self-conscious attempt to use less inflammatory language, not least of all, and this is a, perhaps a specific Kosovo issue, as a result of the well-known and negative role that the media played in fermenting the March 2004 violence. Uh, many of the interviewees were acutely aware of that. Uh, and this was both you know, within the Kosovo Serb and Kosovo Albanian uh, communities. And that has led to a form of transitional uh, self-censorship. The data was mixed on whether that was part of, or should be part of, a wider effort at the media playing a direct role in facilitating reconciliation. We saw a similarly mixed picture about whether the media has or should play a role in historical accounting. What are the implications of these findings? Well, first of all, that there's no one correct way to conduct transitional journalism other than to maintain high standards, and nor should there be. The data does show that discussion or more discussion of transitional justice in the media 
in particular the controversies about it, will help practitioners in the media to own their choices about it. So these are the debates about whether journalists see themselves or recognize themselves as being more or less activist, and about when and whether it's appropriate to take on that role. It also allows importation of insights about the weaknesses of transitional justice. For example, the way that it frequently ignores certain types of victims and certain types of human rights violations, particularly structural ones that may in fact be the root cause of problems. So what I'm saying is those engaged in, 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 in this milieu don't have to reinvent the analytical wheel. They can draw upon the debates about whether practitioners be more or less retributive, reconciliatory, uh, reparatory, restorative, and as I say, own their decisions about how to conduct what we can recognize as being transitional journalism. So that's where this project ends. I will say I want now to explore whether these findings uh, translate and appear in other contexts, uh, and that will help us work out which of the factors are unique to the customer experience, of course, as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. James, and I was a little bit lax because it's his project. I thought, yeah, I thought I'd let him explain what it was. Um, but we'll try and encourage other speakers to, to keep time because I mean, we know Baroness Hellich's time is, 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 is potentially limited. So, so I, do, you, do you want to go first? Well, I mean, I, I think we'd put you I'm, next. I'm, I'm very happy to be next, uh, last. Entirely up to you. Which yes, you so I can get. Uh, of course. <laughs> in which case, we'll go to Florian if that's okay. all right. So thank you. It's my privilege to be here. And um, I have happened to be in London because I'm. Uh, uh, member of, for one year of the Royal College of Defence Studies, so when I heard that the James will be coming here and we will be talking about transition justice in Kosovo, that was a unique opportunity, and to come for the first time here at the House of Parliament. I'm not an expert on transition justice, but obviously as a think tank dealing with security, we cover, uh, you know, like uh, broader issues of security as we recognize security through uh, the lens of, uh, uh, through the holistic lens, basically. Uh, but uh, since we are here in the UK, uh, and since we talk now about transition justice, I'd like to uh, highlight the fact that uh, because now we, uh, you know, like March 20th anniversary of uh, liberation of Kosovo, we need to acknowledge the role of the UK in uh, humanitarian intervention that uh, uh, halted uh, the war and further uh, victims that uh, were supposed to be caused by the Milosevic regime. And I think it's important to mention because. Uh, this intervention, uh, you know, like was something that uh, uh, solved the mistake with respect to Bosnia and Rwanda. And I know that here in the UK, uh, this is not now that very much. Let's say uh, there is no much courage to speak about this after Iraq and Libya. But we need to acknowledge uh, good cases of intervention, humanitarian intervention, and definitely Kosovo is is a good a good case. Initially, when speaking about transitional justice in Kosovo, we saw this through the lens of the international. Uh, uh, tribu tribunal for former Yugoslavia, which dealt with a number of cases. I think the tribunal, as such, has managed to do some tactical victories in uh, terms of, you know, like indicting a number of uh, senior uh, leaders, especially military, military leaders from from former Yugoslav army. But strategically, of course, it did not manage to help the reconciliation process. Maybe the intention was not to help the reconciliation, but you know, like there were lots of hopes at the beginning that the pool of people that would be subject to uh, the international tribunal would be much bigger. Uh, and these were, of course, the expectation. And having in mind the fact that uh, we had 12,000 people that uh, we lost during the war, we have 20,000 uh, uh, raped women during the war, and we still have about 1,300 missing persons. So basically, the, the court managed to, uh, you know, like to indict just a handful of uh, senior uh, military leaders, but in terms of these kind of tactical leaders that were involved in, in, in the war crimes, those uh, are still not uh, subject to, to justice and, uh, and they are being, uh, you know, like even uh, supported and uh, not uh, handed over by, uh, uh, in this case, by, by Serbia. What strikes me in this case is that 
now that we have uh, marked the 20th anniversary, uh, or, uh, we are in the constant state of denial and revisionism of what happened. And this just, you know, like, uh, uh, brings back all uh, of the hopes that we had at the beginning that we will overcome gradually uh, the wounds of the, of the past. You have the position uh, of the official government now uh, about the uh, Red Shack massacre, which killed 45 people, and its official position saying that that was not the massacre, it was an orchestration. And of course, in, in no, in, for, for no uh, massacre that was uh, taking place, there is no uh, apology and recognition of the crimes that were committed. So comparing to the previous, uh, let's say, more liberal governments, which were saying that there were mistakes in the past uh, during the Milosevic regime, the existing uh, establishment is basically denying and doing revision. And this revisionism is being also led by the uh, ongoing uh, disinformation campaign uh, of, of Russia, uh, especially Sputnik, which uh, refers to, which wants to attack basically the um, uh, Western, what they call Western-driven interventions and investments in the Balkans and elsewhere. And of course, uh, also Kosovo from, from itself uh, 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 was very weak in tackling with the crimes that were committed after the war, we have to admit, uh, that because there were very few cases that were, you know, like uh, brought to the court uh, by the local judges. Uh, I'm speaking about some uh, individual retaliation, retali retaliatory cases after the war. But we need to acknowledge that this was especially the uh, responsibility of the international presence, which was, uh, which established the uh, um, hybrid court system in Kosovo, be it through the UN mission until 2008, but also through the ULEX, the European Union Rule of Law mission, which is still present in Kosovo, but until three years ago had prime responsibility when it comes to, when it comes to, the, to the war crime. So from this kind of uh, justice perspective, I think we are really uh, lagging behind and uh, we, we, uh, we did not manage to bring uh, in not, not even nearly justice to many uh, of the, of the uh, victims. Uh, the reason for this might be also because the, these hybrid courts that have been established are uh, not uh, very successful. You have judges coming for six months and leaving, and that other judges taking over the case, which uh, basically could not uh, uh, produce uh, concrete results. And uh, on, on the contrary, because of the political pressures, you had cases where people were indicted uh, without any clear evidence of why they have been indicted, just to make some political, uh, you know, like um, uh, uh, goals uh, when it comes to, to these uh, missions. Uh, from from my personal uh, experiences, that uh, although there were investments in terms of reconciliation, external driven projects, um, second track diplomacy that has been in the relation between Kosovo Albanians and Kosovo Serbs, as well as uh, Kosovo and Serbia. Uh, it is not sufficient as long as there is no uh, top-down approach. As long as there is no recognition of uh, the crimes that were committed first, and there is no uh, deal between uh, both communities, you know, like a macro deal, uh, we still are being uh, subject to some episodes where, if you do a step further in terms of reconciliation, then you have, you know, like uh, we are hit by some episodes of uh, of the narrative. You know, like which somehow brings us back, and I think this is this is something that that could be addressed if we would have a deal between between both countries that would also pave the way for for a transitional uh, justice. And generally speaking, there is lack of political will for this because the elites that are ruling the both countries are elites that were you know like part of uh, of uh, of the system or boys that were involved in, in the past. Uh, you know, like in the combat. Uh, activities and of course in the political uh, dimension of the combat activities. In terms of the institutional set setting, there is a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that has been established by the President of Kosovo. We have been following its, uh, its uh, development. I, in principle, it was a good move, but I personally don't believe in the successful stories of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the sense that those have the tendency of just bringing elites. Uh, you know, like those are uh, th those even have a tendency of uh, being, being a predatory rent seeking platforms where the donors would chip in and bring, uh, you know, like the, uh, the, the famous uh, uh, actors, you know, like, but would have no reach towards the communities. And I think 
this is what is happening also with our Truth and Reconciliation Committee because it is not in the position to project a reconciliation and to uh, basically to affect communities in a positive way. Well, this has been established in the last two years and the results are very minimal. Uh, as far as I know, the discussions are still about the lifespan of the Truth Commission, whether it should tackle only like the two years, which is wrong, of the conflict, like 98, 99, or it should tackle, you know, like the period since 1989 until 2008, meaning that during the 90s we had the uh, repression of the Milosevic regime, and also after the conflict we had the cases of retaliation uh, against, uh, against the Serbs. So, uh, basically, there are no concrete results that we see from the truth and uh, reconciliation committee, so nominally there was a willingness, but in practice. And the reason why we don't have uh, concrete results is not only because there is a lack of reach to the community, but also uh, reaching the Serbian community in Kosovo highly relies on the willingness of official Belgrade. So it is also politically sensitive, you know, like because this issue is being kept, you know, like as a bargaining chip also in terms of the negotiation between, between Kosovo and Serbia. So to conclude, I think that uh, uh, although there were some very good uh, attempts, let's say, by certain donors, uh, and I would highlight the role of Norway, for instance, in Switzerland, you know, like in supporting these initiatives. Uh, in essence, the externally imposed uh, uh, solutions to the truth commissions uh, uh, do not necessarily lead to, to the results, and all of this process of transition justice in Kosovo overly relies on the political willingness and the potential agreement that uh, both countries would have in this case, Kosovo and Serbia. I look forward to any comment or question from, from your side. Thank you so much, Florian, for that uh, very illuminating contribution, which also kept time, which is fantastic. Uh, I, I, I'm not prioritizing that, but it's just a part of my, part of my job. Um, Thank you very much. Really enjoyed being here. Um, I come to the research in Kosovo from a um, slightly more practical point of view. I went into academia later. I worked as part of Kosovo Civil Society um, for a year. I was a researcher in the Kosovo Stability Initiative, X. Um, but as an international, I am not a Kosovo myself. I think that's an important distinction to make. Um, in my academic work, I mainly look at international organizations that intervene in third states, so particularly the European Union intervention in both uh, Kosovo and Bosnia, um, and I've mainly worked with the police so far, so the justice angle is, I've been talking to James about this, slightly new to me. Um, so what I'm looking at is the um, retribution angle to, um, to criminal justice, so criminal justice through trials, holding people accountable through trials. Um, I think there's a very close and important link between these sort of more state-organized um, forms of trials, organized by Kosovo, very much slash in big capitals, the international community in this case, um, and NGOs in the country. There are very important linkages in terms of cooperation, information, dissemination, um, and also a very important watchdog function here. So I do think it's important to see these two together and not sort of as mutually exclusive. So my current work is on the Kosovo Specialist Chambers, which is the fourth attempt to hold um, individuals accountable for war crimes committed in Kosovo and adjacent territories um, during and after the conflict. Um, the fourth iteration, because obviously we've had um, the International um, Tribunal, Florian has mentioned, we've had UNMIX, so the UN mission, the UN administration mission in Kosovo, which has had a mandate to investigate war crimes, and of course since 2008, ULEX, which again has had and still has to a degree influence in um, war crimes cases as well. So why do we really need a fourth attempt? That is sort of the main question I'm trying to understand. Um, so what we're effectively basing this whole new um, hybrid court, because that is what it is, on is the um, 2011 Dick Marty report that um, started investigating allegations mentioned by the former ICTY prosecutor Carla Del Ponte in her 2008 memoirs on organ trafficking by the Kosovo Liberation Army, the so-called Yellow House case. Um, this was investigated then by a special task force um, of the EU, and um, then in 2005, the Kosovo Special Chambers, so you have the actual chambers and then the special prosecutors, so we'll call it chambers to be a little bit more time-saving, 
um, set up as a hybrid court. So a hybrid court here means that it was officially made part of the Kosovo um, court structure, but it is entirely separate. It's staffed by internationals appointed through the EU and through ULEX. It is financed by the EU, um, and it is located in The Hague. So it is entirely separate. But, and this is quite interesting and also very unusual, um, as my colleagues who study courts in much more detail than I do tell me, um, is that the legal basis for this is both to be found in international um, customary law, so looking at international humanitarian law, but also in the Kosovo criminal law and the penal code. And this is because, of course, the period we're looking at here covers both the war but also the post-war period where we can't use customary um, international law anymore. So that's where this is where the Kosovo legal basis had to come in as well. So that's what makes this a hybrid court and a very interesting one at that. Specifically since we've kind of been going away from hybrid courts for, to be honest, quite good reasons. So this is very interesting um, development we've seen in Kosovo and obviously as Florian mentioned it's a development um, we, we're seeing in at the same time as the truth seeking or the truth and reconciliation commission. So we are seeing both developments sort of to a slightly more holistic approach. So in terms of the aims and objectives of the KC, uh, KSC, they, they are meaning to hold to account individuals who committed or commissioned crimes in Kosovo. This last bit is important because it means they can look into crimes that were actually perpetrated in Albania, which is where apparently the Yellow House was um, located. And they're looking at it through the years, through the enti entire three-year period of 1998, 99, and 2000. So both in and outside of the conflict. So this is unusual because it includes the post-war period. It's unusual because it includes more than just the territory of Kosovo. Um, even the ICTY didn't include Albania. Um, and also, and this is where it becomes politically sensitive, while it doesn't specifically say it focuses only on the KLA, the time frame indicates it does, simply because post-conflict you just didn't have the Serb militia there anymore. You had towards the beginning, but you didn't towards the end. And this is where we get into the challenges. Am I okay for time? Yeah, you're fine. Excellent. So three main challenges. Necessity, legitimacy, capacity. So necessity, why do we need this? We've had three iterations of this before. If we really had wanted to hold KLA commanders to account, rather than put them in positions of power and vote them into prime ministership, the international community had more than the ample opportunity to do, to do so. So why now? And this is where public perceptions within Kosovo are fairly negative, with people saying, well, why does the international community want to hold KLA leaders to account now, after they've literally paved their way to get into power beforehand. Is this really um, a genuine attempt at justice, of holding you know, what people call big fish to account, or is this sort of more face-saving kind of um, thing where the EU can yet again say, oh, look how much help we're giving Kosovo. So do we really need this? Um, and is this actually going to, to deliver justice? This is a very big question at the moment. The second one is the legitimacy. So if this was instituted um, through an exchange of letters because the EU was not actually prepared to recognize Kosovo as a lawmaking body. So rather than actually institute this in the way it would with any other countries, it was just formulated through an exchange of letters between then Catherine Ashton and the Kosovo president, um, Adifati Yayaga. So that's a little bit unusual. But it was then voted into law through the Kosovo Assembly. That is the legal basis. That is why it should be legitimate. But we should also be looking at the fact that it was only voted through the Kosovo Assembly under massive international pressure. Um, and even when it had been voted through, a very substantive number of MPs then wanted to revoke it. And again, the Quinn led predominantly here by the US and the UK, um, literally put quite a lot of pressure on individuals to bring this through, which for a legitimacy scholar such as myself does call into question the idea of can we still call this legitimacy or to, how, to what extent was coercion involved here as well. So it is this legitimacy question where on the one hand the court itself um, cannot really be questioned as legitimacy because it wasn't the court who used these sorts of measures, it was the EU and the Quinn setting it up. Um, so strictly speaking, yes, it is legitimate. It was, you know, voted in by an act of parliament. But if we want to look at the slightly more bigger political pictures, um, at least I find this highly dubious. So legitimacy is a big question, and also this links back 
to um, what is perceived as a very clear anti-Albanian focus because of the time frame we're looking at, with people saying this is entirely anti-Albanian, we're only looking to prosecute KLA fighters. If we accept this, the question is, is this actually a problem? The ICTY was usually seen as anti-Serb or very much anti-Serbia, so is this now just sort of the next step to, you know, to actually prosecute KLA people who were not entirely circumvented, but we really only had Fat Milimai and Ramush Haradina as sort of big KLA leaders indicted by the ICTY. So we could ask, is this a problem? Personally, I think it is, but this is open to debate. Um, but what this certainly does mean is that um, it is very difficult to, get, to gather popular legitimacy for this court, popular support within Kosovo, within Kosovo because of this perceived anti-Albanian um, focus. And then, of course, we have the next problem, that the KLA, at least in large parts of the population, are seen as heroes. They've liberated the country. They stopped what was effectively, at the very least, ethnic cleansing. It hasn't officially been called a genocide, but we can debate about these terms if you like. So this also means a massive soul-searching exercise for within Kosovo. How do we remember? Um, and this links, of course, to these larger political revisionist um, political um, tendencies that we've seen in the region in the last couple of years. And the final point, or the final challenge we have, is capacity. Can this court actually, court actually make a difference? The ICTY, ULEX, UNMIC all have massive capacity issues. Kosovo is a very small country, very tightly knit communities. What makes us think that this court can actually keep witnesses safe? can actually make sure that people remember things that happened over 20 years ago more correctly than they have t 10, 15 years ago. So there are very practical challenges. And the court assures us, and they have, at least on paper, very impressive witness protection um, measures in place. Um, but then the ICTY was also not based in Kosovo, and we still had witnesses who couldn't remember, who disappeared, who were murdered. So the question of capacity, can this court actually do what it promises to do, what it has promised very publicly to do um, in practice? So necessity, legitimacy, and capacity are sort of the three challenges um, that we're finally looking at um, at the moment with a court that has, after two years of complete inaction, finally sprung into action in 2019. So it'll be very, very interesting to see if it can actually achieve justice, however we want to define that. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you very much. I, first, I apologise. I was late, and then I apologise. I'll have to leave uh, earlier because we have to. I have to go back. Uh, we are going to start third reading of the uh, European Union bill, so I've got to be there. Anyway, I, I I must say I came here with a completely different speech in my head to the one that I'm going to try and make in the next couple of minutes, and that is entirely influenced by by the colleague from um, Kosovo. And uh, I, I also would like to emphasize, it is, I was born in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and uh, I was, um, in a way, on a receiving end of uh, failed policies of the 1990s under the government of John Major. And uh, having left uh, in 1993 and uh, came to this country, I was also witness of a uh, lessons learned uh, policies that were uh, promoted by the late Robin Cook, who was a foreign secretary uh, in the 19, end of 1990s, and also uh, humanitarian intervention, uh, sort of uh, that was uh, spelled at the Chicago speech by uh, Tony Blair just ahead of the intervention in Kosovo. And, I, and I, I have to agree that had it not been for Iraq, uh, Tony Blair would have gone down as one of the most successful prime ministers that this country has had since Churchill. Uh, and this is quite a high order considering uh, the, the success of 1982 when Margaret Thatcher intervened in the Falklands, or then prime minister. Uh, so I would really like to emphasize that it, is, it, it doesn't get recognized in this country. Uh, intervention because of Iraq and Libya and, uh, if you want, um, uh, uh, Syria, in a way, has become an unpopular uh, uh, issue. But had it not been for the intervention that was led by the United, that United Kingdom and the United States, by Madeleine Albright and Tony Blair and... Uh, uh, Robin Cook, I think we would have been uh, 
we would have been in a completely different situation today. We would have not been speaking about only ethnic cleansing. We would have been speaking about you know, wholesale genocide that would have taken place in Kosovo. And I think that needs to be recognized. I would like, I, I, I also want to agree with uh, the, the, the element of deni not only denial but revisionism that has taken root not only in Kosovo but in Bosnia as well. Today, you wouldn't believe it, but uh, we will be marking 25 years since uh, genocide took place in Srebrenica. If you were to walk down the street in Srebrenica today, you would see huge posters of uh, uh, Ratko Mladic, general who was in charge of uh, uh, killings in, in Srebrenica, uh, Radovan Karadzic, who was the president of so-called uh, Republika Srpska, uh, and other people who were directly responsible ended up in The Hague, uh, sat, uh, are either in The Hague today, uh, some have <coughs> been released, like uh, President Plavšić, and they continue not only to deny uh, what they committed or what was committed on their behalf, but they continue to have champions in the political elites in, in Bosnia. And that is really not a good start for reconciliation or transitional justice. Uh, at all. And the one thing I would like to emphasize here, I don't want to go into too many details, but I think one issue that we have failed to understand when it comes to the Balkans it is the fact that we have lost strategic patience in Brussels, in London, in Washington. For some, to me, totally unexplainable reason, we thought and still think that all we needed to do is stay there for a short period of time and somehow, by some miracle, people are going to go back and start loving each other, sharing in, in the success of uh, uh, post-war era without that justice being delivered. So whereby you have ICTY and uh, you know, some semblance of justice, if you are still capable of reinterpret it and if you're still capable of uh, uh, work, revising what was done then and presenting it to the population, you are in a position not only of denying justice, but you're in a position of cementing the gains that were achieved during the war and with the Dayton Peace Accords. And I think one major mistake that has been made both by, uh, as I say, Brussels and Washington and, um, and London is to presume that by 2006 we somehow managed to deal with the issue particularly in Bosnia, and all we needed to do is walk away and f leave a few communiques and a few international offices that we made almost entirely incapable of doing their work. And here I think of Office of High Representative, which not only has lost little by little its, um, its funding, uh, but I think about uh, uh, military presence, because it used to be NATO strong NATO military presence, which has now withered down to, I think, around 800 people on the ground, hodgepodge, not of, not strong sort of uh, 800 strong uh, presence from countries that can actually act and potentially prevent any <coughs> uh, uh, uncertainty and disturbances, but it is three soldiers from this country, two soldiers from that country, etc all together having three helicopters, two of which do not work, and all under the guise of led by the uh, NATO with some over-the-horizon troops that are going to help and save everything if it goes down the, down the hill. And I think the major lesson uh, that I hope uh, I can share with you here, also within this context of transitional justice, is that if you, if you don't sit there and try and rebuild the country, but not by rebuilding uh, ro roads only, but bringing a new generation of people who will think differently, who will want to build a country that is a country for everyone, not just country for some, uh, we are at a losing streak. And I often try to remind my colleagues, particularly in Brussels, that 70-something uh, years after the Second World War, we still have troops in Germany. And Germany is highly developed, democratic country that is in no need of military presence and such. But because we had that strategic patience to see Germany through both the division and reunification and progress made further down the road, we today can talk about the most democratic country in Europe. 
in the Balkans there is no such country. Whether you talk about Serbia, whether you talk about Croatia, whether you talk about that is also uh, that Croatia today is an EU country that is presiding as a pres it's a president of the EU, and that same country, president of that country, has been seen very publicly to have justified uh, actions that were taken by war criminals, people who have committed crimes, and people who have spent time in the Hague or in the European prisons and have come back. And that is not the way forward. So I think the way in which you can achieve that transitional justice is uh, not only by using the courts, but admitting the rights and wrongs, and also exercising that strategic patience to allow space and oxygen <coughs> for the new generation to take over from those who not only took the country to the war, but continue to maintain that pressure on that country or country in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Helich. Um, and thank you very much, everyone, who's come in over the course of the events. We know the queues out there have been fairly horrific. There's a comp uh, competing with Amal Clooney next door and a big Holocaust memorial thing. So thank you for your, your strategic patience in staying in the queue. I'm um, going to open up for questions now. And if I take them in rounds of three, ideally, and if you can please say who you are and if you come from anywhere in particular, let us know your, any affiliations you have. Um, so... Does anyone want to put up their hands and uh, kick us off? So it's the gentleman there. We used, and then the lady at the back there. And then, um, yes, yeah, so we'll start there and then we'll see if someone else puts their hand up while they're doing that. Oh, and the woman there. Lovely, thanks. Mm -hmm. Excellent, fantastic. So, if you want to start. Um, yeah, Ian, if I work with the Foreign Office, we used to have and I was formerly British Ambassador in Bosnia and Herzegovina and in Kosovo. Um, could, could I just ask the panel, I'm afraid I'm one of the people caught in the queue, so sadly I didn't hear particularly what Florian had to say. Um, but could I ask you, Florian in particular mentioned the bottom-up approach. Do you think that the real problem is that we look at these questions uh, about the transition justice still from a very international, um, top-down uh, fashion? Uh, and. Um, do you think that part of the problem is that we need to work more on getting a single narrative of what actually happened? I mean, even when I was in Bosnia back in 2001, uh, when there was a lot of focus on what was happening in South Africa, people used to say the problem in Bosnia is there are three versions of history. And until you have one version of history to bring the tram lines together, is it really possible to have a proper process of Lovely. Thank you. Is, that, is it Mary? Mary uh. Dijewski, um, I'd like to be independent in other people. Um, it's really a question of um, quite similar in a way in, in, in music. Um, Brandon's Hedge, you talked about um, the need to bring on a new generation uh, of leaders who will see building um, a united society um, without sort of conflict. Um, but I wonder how how realistic that really is because in the form of um, parts of Yugoslavia, um, basically the fighting was for exactly the opposite, um, that the republics and the constituents of um, parts of those republics should actually be national entities. And I wondered how far it's possible to get away from that. Um, without maybe looking at um, reconstituting the Islamic, which is obviously something totally unrealistic. Thank you. And the woman. Yeah. Uh, just to uh, I work in anthropology, as you can hear from my name. My parents are from Oxford, so I know so much about it from a very first hand perspective. I think bringing it back maybe more towards the journalism aspect. Dr. Jai, you touched on denial and revisionism and barriers there. Visionism and Baroness Village too. How do we tackle that through journalism and the media? Because from my limited experience of constant media, it's quite limited in bringing out the truth. So again, the same about bringing back, sort of bringing the timelines together, finding a version of history, and um, you still have older generations who are berating newer media outlets that try to maybe expose corruption, political mess, and things like that. How do we get change their attitudes and move forward and 
Thank you very much. That's some, some really fascinating questions there. And I'll open for it open to the panel to respond. And feel free to answer the bits that you feel most uh, appropriate to you. Um, just stop the first off on the Thank you. I'll just have a very quick one on, on Bosnia. I Often when I go to Bosnia, I talk about Robert Mugabe syndrome. Some people who are in power in Bosnia have been in power for the last 20, 25 years. And they're the people who have brought with them the ideas of nationalism and who are maybe potentially not even nationalists, but it suits them because they keep their if you want, uh, their tribes, they keep them hostages to the idea that they are the only ones who can defend them. And they take out the oxygen out of young... I, I actually have a huge uh, faith in young people because I have... Uh, I spend quite a lot of time... We have something called the International Leaders Program that Foreign Office has instituted where they bring uh, people from Serbia, Bosnia, Kosovo, Macedonia, etc., you name it, from all three communities in Bosnia, or four, I should say. And I rarely encounter with them the nationalism of the kind that you can experience if you speak to someone who not only was a part of the war, but was a part of a post-war corruption and uh, uh, kind of enrichment. That was, so they can't actually leave the, the power, because leaving the power means actually facing up to the, what they have done for themselves and their cronies. So I believe that investing in young people, giving them an opportunity not to... You, you, you're not going to solve anything either by forcing someone to live in imaginary Yugoslavia, however good it was for some, or by dividing uh, communities into small statelets that are going to be ethnically pure and therefore that they are going to secure some sort of semblance of stability for a long time. I'm afraid I kind of don't buy into that. I think giving people space, young people who have not been corroded by nationalism and who have not been poisoned by nationalism, space to develop and space to express themselves and space to live. They don't want anything. They don't want to, for, to spend the rest of their lives hating each other. They want to spend the rest of their li lives living like normal European citizens. But if you, from the early ages, separate them in different schools, like in central Bosnia, where there, you have one school or you have two doors, one for Croats, one for Bosniaks, that's crazy. Why does anyone from the European Union give grants to towns or to the projects that have that sort of element in them? You are sort of raising people who are going to be fed nationalism, live nationalism, walk and talk nationalism, and end up in the same way. So I think investing in young people, taking them out, giving them an opportunity, not closing them into the, into the ethnic uh, sort of statelets is the way forward. There's no other one. And talking about how do you address the, the, the journalism, etc., I think we ought to play the Sputnik game because Sputnik is uh, a Russian uh, station that is freely available to every single radio station in Bosnia, in Serbia, in Macedonia, etc. They can plant any kind of story, and they do. Anything that they want to say, by the time you have uh, fact-check it in a country that hasn't got capability of fact-checking it, you have already spilt you know, some ideas among the population that this country is against that country, that this fraction is against that fraction. So I was very pleased to hear that BBC, BBC World Service and BBC has come back to Belgrade and hopefully is going to start spreading further in the region because you have to find this information warfare that Sp Sputnik has unleashed on the region in the same way, but not with fake news and not with lies, but with facts. Hence, I always encourage my colleagues and I uh, that we, we look into BBC World Service as a positive tool with which we can speak with the facts against those who are spreading lies and are using, particularly Russia, are using that region to, to uh, sow division and unrest. No, that's really important. And I think yeah, making sure the BBC World Service materials are able to be used by local stations for their own stuff because it, it's the fact that Sputnik is a wire service is, I, I, I look at them in the rest of the former Soviet Union it, it's, yeah, the fact that they're freely available just giving it out yeah. uh, to be repackaged and respun without knowing that Sputnik is the original source is the, is the, is the killer um, Florian yes uh, so nice to see Ambassador the clip here and thank you for, uh, for your question um, obviously as you, as you know from your service in the Balkans uh, there is a there is a bottom-up approach, but it was internationally driven. 
and I didn't see it wrong, and I still don't see it wrong in the sense that you have uh, civil society organizations from both communities cooperating even more and more, uh, trade unions cooperating, businesses cooperating, organized crime also cooperating both perfectly, as we know. So th there is there is a constituency of uh, bottom-up approach, which is uh, unfortunately still international driven, but I think now it's more established. The problem is that. Uh, as long as we don't have this kind of top uh, top down approach in the sense that the, there is going to be a political settlement, uh, in this case now I talk between Kosovo and Serbia, which is key, at least from the Kosovo perspective, but also from the Serbian perspective. And if we don't have the tendency, the structural tendency, I would call, for revisionism, which is being laid out now, uh, then, you know, like we cannot really rely on. On, on the on the existing platforms that we have, so it's not sufficient. Even if we empower further the, this kind of you know like grassroots involvement of uh, civil society and even communities and even associations of the victims of the war, that I see them all the time going to the media speaking you know like about missing persons. The moment that you see you know like uh, a statement uh, you know like uh, at the detriment of the war or you know like. At the detriment of other uh, community, then it just you can you you see it, you know like we can sense it. I sense, you know like I frequently go to Belgrade, you know like, and then when when I go back to to Pristina and I speak to to people that you know like we need to find a way, you know like of moving forward, and then people say, well, how can we move forward if we have this state of denial, you know like revisioning? So it's, it makes life difficult for us trying to push forward things. So I think it, it, it needs bottom up should be merged in this case. The top down is not sufficient, definitely to have to have only this grassroots approach. In terms of uh, of the media, uh, we have a completely commercialized uh, way of, of media. It's a click based approach, as you know, you know, like your native speaker. So uh, basically, for them, it's important that you put this uh, spectacular title so people would have interest to go through it, rather than produce, you know, like a meaningful. Uh, article that would, you know, like uh, help, uh, let's say, eventually uh, transition justice. Those that do uh, articles and help eventually, uh, you know, like with the articles, transition justice and reconciliation, those do not have the reach that we would. So though they reach only the elites, not the, the tabloids, they reach the wider communities, you know, like, and you see that in Pristina, but especially in Belgrade, when they are very spectacular in the way how they. They, they launch information, misinformation, and then suddenly you have in Pristina, you know, like they just copy paste, paste, you know, like all of this news, and then, you know, like you have this kind of what I would call a reciprocal narrative, you know, like that you basically have in, in the vernacular of politicians and, and, and other actors. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, two quick comments. New generation of leaders, and is it realistic to expect change? I think it is. Um, we now have, since the last election, um, got a new government in place. It's the first time now that, um, that well, the war wing um, coalition has been voted out, obviously with the collapse of the Ramush Hadinai government. And I think it is important and noteworthy to see that we now have Edwin Dorsey as the strongest party coming out of the elections. They're not an amazingly, they're, they're not new as in they were movement before, but they are a new political party and there are new ideas that are represented. And yes, some of them are looking back at the past, um, but a lot of them are also looking forward. Um, also, half Kosovo is under 25, right? So there are a lot of, there's a generation of people now growing up that haven't actually lived through the war. So I would say, yes, there are new leaders coming through. There is a new generation coming through. Floria mentioned the role of civil society, which is mainly staffed by people under 45, well, actually probably under 35. So I do think that is coming through, and we do see that. Um, what can the media really do? I'm a bit surprised we haven't actually talked so much about the links to politics here in the media because, of course, especially with Kosovo, according to UNDP, the vast majority of Kosovars get their news um, over the TV. And, of course, especially in the past, I'm not so sure about now. Here, my information is not entirely up to date. Um, we've seen massive political influence through RTK, through the, the main state um, media provider, or the state, main state television channel. So I do think that is something we, we do need to question, the close links with politics and the potential influence that we see through that as well. And I'm sure that's something James has come across in his interviews as well. Thank you. Good. Yeah, thank you for the questions. Um, Ambassador Cliff, we met briefly when I was out there work, doing work with the Supreme Court Constitutional Court, but it's before I had my fancy beard, <laughs> uh, in case that was uh, boxing. 
Uh, both yourself and the contributor from, from Kosovo mentioned the issue of historical accounting and revisionism. Uh, you also mentioned the, 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 the bottom-up uh, approach to such issues. And I would agree with Florian that although it is important to have, um, gra well, have and harness grassroots approaches to uh, historical accounting, it isn't a zero-sum game between doing either something internationally sponsored or encouraged or uh, at the local level. The project that I've been talking about this evening was designed to look at the role of civil society in general and the media in particular, given that in Kosovo there is almost complete absence of formal transitional justice mechanisms other than those devoted to criminal prosecution. Uh, we've seen, for example, the Humanitarian Law Centre uh, establish the Kosovo Memory Book. So this is a civil uh, society organisation originally based out of Belgrade that has done a, a, a remarkable job of identifying every, or well, attempting to identify every single loss of life and disappearance uh, in relation to the, the extended period of, uh, of the 1999 conflict, that's to say including the uh, retribution attacks afterwards as well. Um, there hasn't been a successful attempt yet to establish a regional truth commission. Um, that, the wheels fell off that last summer. Um, there is, of course, Hakim Thatchy's uh, truth commission in Kosovo. Um, my interviewees had a certain healthy scepticism about how that process would, would, would pan out. Um, but as I say, it was, it was the institutional vacuum that made me want to look at what was happening in the absence of concerted efforts of truth-telling. And what my data was showing me is that the media are not having that conversation with themselves <coughs> about the tension between being objective on the one hand an activist on the other, and what engaging with historical accounting or counter revisionism, whatever you want to call it, plays in that relationship. Um, and so, part of the findings that what I want to get across is to encourage that conversation about how and when the media should be activist, and how and whether that can be compatible with objectivity and you know principles of, of, of fair journalism. As I say, it seems to me that within the data, there's, there's, there's real confusion as to whether that could or should be the role of the media, and whether they have or haven't already done that. Um, now, as I say, I, I want to harness the, the, the wider literature on transitional justice and peace journalism, so that those involved in this bottom-up approach to historical accounting or advocating victims' rights or whatever, understand that they are in that 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 milieu and can, you know, equipped with a sufficient analytical frame, take those choices for themselves without having to, as I put it previously, reinvent the analytical wheel. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Go back to any round of questions. I saw a gentleman there. Let's see anyone other hands. Woman there. We'll start with you two in the middle. Okay, gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much, Keith Besson, former MP and a lawyer by profession. I can claim no special knowledge of the Balkans, so forgive me if my questions seem slightly naive. Um, but for many years, I chaired an international NGO called the World Federalism Movement based in The Hague in New York, which uh, has as its principal <coughs> project um, hosting the coalition of the International Criminal Court. So we work very closely with the ICC judges. We convene the Assembly of States Parties and, uh, uh, and such like. And of course, one of the principal themes of the ICC has been to try to encourage uh, domestic capacity for trials, not to bring people to the Hague, but actually to have them tried as in Uganda and, 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 and elsewhere. And, and so, and, and Florian referred to the frustration about judges changing over very rapidly and everything. So my first naive question is how, how practical is it to try to build a domestic capacity to hear some of these cases of former war crimes and those which come within the jurisdiction of the ICC? 
uh, and the second <coughs> corollary to that is really um, how difficult is that when we hear from Arminga Helich and, and, and others uh, how sectarian that society still is and how in effect there are going to be parts of society which will deliberately shield either practically or reputationally those who should or might be brought before the courts. I mean, is the whole thing just a chronicle of, of, uh, of unfulfilled dream to actually try to get something like that, both in terms of domestic capacity, uh, but also to try to get people uh, no longer to shield those who should actually appear before tribunals? Many thanks, Keith. Hi. Um, again, uh, no, not again. I'm actually no expert in uh, anything anywhere near as advanced as that, uh, but from either in the Balkans. Um, but my question, it was um, somewhat inspired by Baroness Hedges' um, speech and then um, information by yourselves as well. You, I was very interested to hear about TV being the primary source of news still. But I wondered, um, increasingly with people using social media, particularly for such a young country's population, obviously that increases the risk of disinformation and again it impacts on the narrative. How is that being countered or uh, influenced as far as you are around from a, a journalistic perspective? Because in many ways now the, the lines between social media and journalism are increasingly blurred. And would be really interested to hear from Thank you so much. Um, Mary is part of Regents University. Uh, thank you. Uh, this question about what do you think about the impact of the economics of the independence as well, and you know, which is powered by the no recognition, continuing the recognition of key states that are involved in the genocide overall in the international arena, and uh, you know, including the EU states, without how that's you know, a great problem for the time. Thank you very much. Uh, James, do you want to kick us off? And yes, if, if, if I may. Um, starting with you, your questions, um, and Keith, if I may. Um, you were alluding to the, the idea of, uh, of what I would call complementarity, the International Criminal Court, that the, the court isn't meant to get involved where a state is both willing and able to you know, deal with the crime um, under discussion. Uh, as you said, uh, there is also, therefore, uh, what you might call positive complementarity, and that is that the, as a result of states signing up to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, many have taken the opportunity to improve their domestic legislation in relation to international crimes. For example, taking um, a broader approach to rape as a war crime, uh, which was recognised uh, really only at the Tribunal for uh, former Yugoslavia, and rape as the act of of genocide, which was only recognized for the first time uh, at the tribunal for uh, Rwanda. Uh, so, as I say, states are, are being inspired by, by that, that work. And you're asking how, how practical it is for certain states to try those crimes. Uh, and the answer, on a case-by-case basis, is, is not very practical at all. <laughs> Um, but that's, that's why you need know, criminal court is available. Obviously, there's problems in relation to harnessing it, in relation to cost of both. Um, one interesting point, though, about the positive complementarity is that it is boxing states into a very international criminal law mind. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but there's a question, you know, would the principle of complementarity be... Uh, would the threshold be met, for example, by a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that withheld the possibility of prosecution? There is a very strong answer that would, uh, with a very convincing argument, that would not be sufficient to prevent the ICC getting involved. And so it means our responses, transitional, post-conflict, however you want to label them, as a result of the ICC, are being pushed down that more retributive avenue, whereas as I said before, at different times and in relation to different transitions, we could be having a conversation about whether the approach should be more or less retributive, reconciliatory, rehabilitative, or, 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 or reparative. Uh, but to reiterate what I did say before, the ICC was such a massive step forward because 
neither the tribunal for Rwanda nor Yugoslavia had any capacity whatsoever to award compensation or reparations uh, to victims, whereas the ICC can, and it has this arm's length uh, trust fund for victims to which you and I can donate, non-state parties to the Rome Statute can donate, uh, and that does some fantastic strategic interventions on the ground in countries affected by the crimes that the ICC uh, has been investigating. So that's my little reaction on that. That's not very little, is it? Um, you, your question on, on the media, one quick thing. Uh, I was in Kosovo last summer, um, summer 2018 that is. No, 2019. Uh, anyway, uh, working with UN women are training, well, working with young journalists on uh, reporting wartime sexual and gender-based violence. They had all experienced real difficulties. You know the way most newspaper articles are republished online and are interactive and you can leave comments. They were having huge problems with abuse in, in that forum. And that's before you even get into real, you know, social media writ large. Uh, and yes, there, there are massive problems. Now, in terms of my own research, the problems with the social media were represented in the interview data with the professional journalists. And we chose not, in, in this project, not to look at so-called citizen journalism. Um, but as I say, represented in our data, there's all sorts of concern about um, social media and the negative impact of your unrestrained sharing of poorly sourced um, uh, stories. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely an issue. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Very interesting question. Um, first one practicality of building capacity in the country, yes, and that is happening. I mean, that was that was a very integral part of, of both UNMIC and ULEX's mandate, was to build um, both police and judicial capacity and prosecutorial capacity for that matter. Um, from my point of view, vastly more successful in the police realm than it was in the justice and prosecutors realm, but also for very political reasons, um, both from the EU and, and from Kosovo, we have to admit. Um, so that, that does happen, but what we are seeing is that actually local um, judges were not particularly happy with ULEX pulling out gradually um, of the war crimes tribunals because judges in Kosovo earn very little money. There is no protection for them whatsoever. The court police now exists in theory, but it's very weak. So the idea that um, a single judge who earns what, six to 800 euros a month wants to take on Hashim Thachi's trial for war crimes um, is entirely ludicrous. So in that sense, we still run into these structural problems that we have seen over the past 20 years or so. So it's a decided yes and no um, to, to, your, to your question. It is happening, but the politically sensitive cases are still, even by locals, very much shoved towards ULEX um, and now the, the K, um, the Kosovo Special Chambers. Um, and then very briefly, role of non-recognition, very important thing here. Five EU states do not recognize Kosovo, right? That's the reason why the um, why ULEX is working on a on neutral mandate, a non-state recognition mandate, which of course has undermined um, its, its work to a substantive, substantive degree. And also the Kosovo Special Chambers is not based on a contract, but is based on an exchange of letters, which of course means the EU could do practically what they want. There's no contract establishing what the relationship is. There is from the Kosovo side of things because it's based in Kosovo law, so the Kosovan side is pretty much nailed to the floor, but the EU side isn't. So yes, that, that clearly has very very practical implications. Right. Yeah. Uh, so on the question of the capacities, uh, this is the argument we used, you know, like when we talked to, to Ulex, we said like, the more you stay here, uh, the more you uh, contribute to the laziness of local judges and prosecutors in this sense. Because uh, at some point you will leave and then they have to start from scratch on dealing with the war crimes. And this is what is happening, you know, like because by then the local judges, when the ULEX was dealing with these cases, and they no longer deal now because they are, you know, like uh, phasing out, uh, the local judges and prosecutors will say this is the portfolio of the international judges, you know, like, so they were vesting this, you know, like to them and they were not dealing with that because you know, like they, they had a legal argument for that. Uh, 
for the EULEX to be present there, I think there was a political interest rather than, I mean, I'm being cynical, but political rather than a justice or legal interest, in the sense that that was uh, called as a, uh, the strongest EU uh, civilian uh, and rule of law instrument that EU had as part of this kind of tendency to act as a global actor. Uh, so uh, because of this political willingness, they were trying by all means to have these kind of responsibilities, which now it turned that it was wrong because the results are, are very, very limi limited. And as I said, you know, like, uh, actually they could, they could not contribute to capacity because they didn't have any kind of capacity building platform as such. They were delivering justice. Capacity building of the local judges in Kosovo was delivered through the bilateral support, namely US, and later on some EU funding, but not through the instrument of, of ULEX. You know, like they, have, they, may, they may have learned from some experience you know, like of judges, but it's difficult to learn if you have judges coming from completely different jurisdictions, you know, like having no uh, affiliation whatsoever uh, you know, like to, like, I don't want to name, but if you have a judge from a Scandinavian country or Ireland, in a completely different jurisdiction with, with our, which is more continental, let's say Austrian related, you know, like it's 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 very difficult, you know, like to to bring to bring some concrete results. In terms of uh, all of the uh, reach and uh, uh, TV is no longer uh, the primary source, you know, like uh, it changed, yeah, because this was before. No. Uh, it, it, no. No, it, it changed actually because the reach of internet in Kosovo is over 90%. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's with the portals actually, you know, like, uh, and uh, this is the problem because it's very, well with the TV you could have some sort of regulatory framework with the portals and, and, and tablets, it's very difficult to, and this, we are talking about electron, electronic, you know, like tablets, it's very difficult to exercise uh, some sort of uh, control when it comes to, you know, like misuse inf of information and so on and so forth. Brilliant. Uh, we'll take one more round of questions um, because uh, we can go over slightly because we, uh, I know so many people coming late, but uh, we'll try and keep this set around fairly brief. Uh, so, gentleman there, uh, gentleman there, and we'll start, we'll start with those two and we'll take some more. Simeon Dukic from the Institute for Strategic Dialogue in London. My question is directed to You mentioned the combination of top down and bottom up approaches in terms of solving it, and it's a, comp it's a combination that needs to work. Yes. Nevertheless, where do you see the lead? Uh, coming from the region, I know that in terms of politics uh, and how you have a, uh, you have a symptom of state, state capture in all of these countries, politics leads from top to bottom, right? Yes. In terms of how uh, the leaders on the top level have a huge influence within the local communities through their cronies and can influence public discourse and public opinion. You rightfully mentioned that in terms of vocal or grassroots uh, movements initiative, they've been largely led to internationals. But do you think if there, there's more control in terms of local, localized, not internationally driven grassroots levels, do you think that they can influence policy and they can influence discourse uh, without further uh, incentive, incentives from abroad? Thank you. Uh, there was a gentleman there. Hello there, everyone. Once again, I'm here at the region of Kosovo Embassy. Uh, I will actually be in Kosovo official here. I wear an invisible hat for being a UN uh, official, officer in Iran. I used to live in London, left uh, to all that from a liberated country, and happened to work with UN. With, uh, Mr. Kushner and uh, Dr. Kushner and the rest. When it comes to uh, judiciary, uh, I wanted to bring to the table uh, something in the past of the months. Uh, if uh, you want to see how difficult it is uh, for internationals to chip in, for you to uh, partake in the living just a different uh, society, I can tell you that uh, from 99, for six months, the uh, international community that is UN is trying to uh, enforce certain criminal law in, in Kosovo. I was part of it, and of course my advice to Mr. Kushner to the principal of the government is that it will not work. For uh, why I'm saying this, because people wanted to introduce it, they had not proof where they go, and what has happened there. There were eight federal units, one of them in Kosovo, Kosovo, or Kosovo, all of them having constitution and all of them having criminal laws. 
they are not code on their own. The boss on the land is one being a developer. So instead of trying to go back to 74, which was pre pre uh, pre uh, when the, the economy, before the abolition of the economy, they were trying to enforce third criminal, criminal law that Milosevic was enforcing until 99. And it took five or uh, six months for them to understand that it did not work. My advice to my boss was not only a new lawyer, but not a civil customer lawyer, lawyer, law graduate who enforced this. If uh, I think my draw two decisions to, to suck two civil court judges, and that was my advice, that was taken further, and then there was some chatting at the international level, and it was stopped. It was that in relation number two, I was working there for regulation number three, and uh, which then stated that the legislation because it goes back to pre uh, March pre which was basically the regulation where uh, customer economy. That local justice were willing and able to, to apply. So that just you know, just you know how it actually worked. And uh, uh, I will uh, ask a very simple question. And, uh, just uh, sort of as the uh, interesting things you can see as well is uh, the first the first decision on extradition, international law, international uh, law had no law to do. Had no clue. I took part in the first extradition in 1999 to discover the land, the uh, as the UN mission, but they had no clue. They didn't know as uh, someone mentioned the uh, legal legal culture, you know, trying to get we even tried, we were, I was a member of the team that went to Louisiana to get some advice from Louisiana being a civil state in, 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 in the US. So uh, this was the background against the way, against which the UN was trying to build the justice. We built all the courts, physical services, we reenacted 40 pieces of legislation, and I will never forget. The first one was traffic safety law. Because the police could not enforce it. Mm -hmm. Now, at the end of my question, you always uh, uh, going back to what you were saying about uh, click technology and, and things. Yes, I agree with that. This is the number one that we will use it. And very often, the same rule that you see in different countries with negative content is <coughs> multiplied and multiplied. <coughs> my question to you is, and I've seen this especially the journalists that deal with uh, judicial affairs and uh, uh, calls and businesses, they are not equipped to do the job. Why? They don't know what the judge is. They don't know what the, 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 the uh, war and the, the sort of what the prosecutor has to do. They don't know the basics of the constitution and the legal process be civil but also more, more important with the criminal the criminal procedure. They don't know. So my question to you is how much do you think this will play into the role that goes straight into your your, your uh, subject of tonight's uh, debate? How the, how do you think and what can be done so the uh, journalists are more equipped to deal with the issue? Because if they don't know the subject, have to report. Okay. Um, anyone want any last questions to join them? Going, going, done. Right, okay. Uh, go back to the panel, and if you want to use any f the time to also give any conclusion remarks that you'd like to make, James, is it your idea? Your, your, your okay, well, uh, quick, quick response uh, at the end there about you know, the media not knowing about the law. Again, that was reflected in the research data here. Uh, for this project, you know, understanding what the tribunal for former Yugoslavia was, what the difference between war crimes, crimes against humanity was, all this sort of stuff. Now, my day-to-day -day living is teaching the law, so I think the solution is for me to be hired to teach more law. Um, and that's what I did, working with those journalists in um, Kosovo, and it was the summer of 2018, I was right, actually, the first time. Um, uh, on, on looking at wartime sexual and gender-based violence because there are difficult questions to be asked and answered even about what rape is uh, and, and against whom it can be committed. In English law, it is impossible to rape a man. Um, so, you know, there are, as a matter of law, okay, um, so 
there's, there's, you know, it's, I think it is important to sort of broaden the, the, the knowledge base, particularly those who are charged with reporting on, on the justice sector. Um, the other issue that I think you raised, though, was a, a common, actually, issue in, in, in transitional contexts, and that's to do with a loss of institutional memory when it becomes necessary to reform, reform the security sector and the judiciary. The same thing happened in um, uh, reunified Germany. I've got a colleague who was a, a former East German judge. He was allowed to retain his job uh, after reunification. Many were, were not permitted to continue. Kosovo has the double problem, uh, of course, because so many people were prevented from attending university that there was not only a loss of institutional knowledge, there was a complete absence of institutional capacity. Um, and I played a small role, again, on a project supported by the, um, the, the British Embassy in Kosovo, uh, working with the Kosovo Judicial Institute, as it was then called, um, on, on training judges and prosecutors, and also, again, as I mentioned, with the judges of the Supreme Court and Constitutional Court. Uh, and, you know, it was fascinating work, but it's, 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 it's difficult, and uh, I hope that I played at least some small uh, positive role in relation to that. As for summing up, um, uh, just listen to me. No. Um, that's <laughs> uh, yeah. All, all I can say is I, I, I've, I've, I've been very uh, impressed hearing all the, the questions and comments that we've received, and um, I'd reiterate my, my thanks to the rest of the panel mm -hmm. uh, and yourselves. That's very very kind of James. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think the point I would like to pick up on was um, with regards to the first question in terms of local influence and policy without international support. Um, I do see that happening. Florian will be in a better position to comment on that. But what I think, what I've seen from my own experience is the problem of money, um, the idea of donor dependency and how we actually pay people's salaries, um, especially working in, in the non-governmental um, sector. And I think that is a key challenge, that um, we need NGOs in course, we need Kosovo civil society to become self-sustaining. Um, and that, that is a big problem at the moment. Um, a lot of research, um, this is my own research, goes into the direction where the money is, um, and therefore has a very directed agenda um, that is not necessarily um, congruent with key local interests. Um, and I think that is a problem that we need to work on. Um, and then secondly, and I think this is something the, the gentleman, um, gentleman's comment reflected, is that there, is a very, there are structural reasons for the weakness of Kosovo's judiciary. And I think training the history of Kosovo, the history of the conflict, um, are important. So when we talk about the judiciary being the Achilles heel of Kosovo's otherwise improved, strengthened um, rule of law capacity, it is important to understand why that is the case. Um, and that, that there has been a long time in effectively building this lack of capacity or leading up to this lack of capacity and that this isn't something that, you know, the kind of short-term knee-jerk reactions that um, the international community is prone to will solve, but that this is something that needs to be done over a longer period of time and I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Don't worry, that's just uh, the uh, adjourning of the, of the House Commons. Um, yes, I, I will be anyhow brief on the... Uh, bottom-up approach. I, I don't think that bottom-up approach is sufficient. Like, and it was no, never considered. I think bottom-up approach in grass, uh, grass and community involvement uh, uh, was important, especially at the, at the time when there was uh, um, when we started from scratch. In the sense, there was no dialogue at all going on between officially between communities. So there were involvement of civil society and so on. So. Even if we have the best civil society with uh, the greatest money and funding, that cannot, you know, like influence, you know, like uh, and change the narratives that both communities officially follow. Uh, I think that we have come to the stage that this bottom-up approach should be strengthened, but it will be weakened the moment that we will not find a solution, political solutions between both communities, which is the elephant in the room. A solution that could be could be translated into a peace treaty, you know, like that would people would say that okay, we now move on, and then they would gradually, you know, like start to let's say uh, forgive and you know like recognize uh, the, the crimes that were committed, and this is the this is the way forward in the sense that we would really uh, move towards towards future. Otherwise, 
uh, relying solely in the bottom, in, in, in these grassroots communities and the work of civil society, I think that that's, that's something that is, not, is no longer going to be sustainable. It will end up as a rent seeking, you know, like platform, you know, like that people will just benefit from this, but in essence, it will not project any kind of change. Thank you so much, Ryan, and thank you so much to everyone for what has been, I think, a really thoughtful and, and uh, detailed debate. Um, so, huge thanks to you all for coming, huge thanks to our panel, huge thanks to the University of Lancaster for this partnership today that we are, and, 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 and for James's work um, uh, and research. Um, he has got some copies of um, some of the information he talked about in his opening statement here, if you'd like to take a copy uh, when you leave, um, there's no, no requirement to you, but obviously they're here if they'll be of interest to you as a, as, as a takeaway. We'll also send that round with a copy of the um, uh, recording for um, of, of tonight's discussion. So thank you very much for everyone for coming and uh, have a good evening. <laughs>